In this video, I will try to cover a few key points from my Oasis concept scene, and hopefully do justice to a few tips that I've picked up that really apply to any 3D scene. In keeping with my previous videos, I will start with the inspiration for this piece. As much as I love Lynch's quirky original, I really mean Villeneuve's most recent barren but beautiful adaptation of Arrakis. This film really captures the intimidating sprawl of the dunes framed by cracked and eroded cliffs that excellently portrays the setting of a barely hospitable desert. But unlike a film that can build this world up over hours, my 10 second scene needed something more immediately interesting. So unlike Arrakis, which lacks any surface water, my desert eventually became an oasis. As the water had now taken the central focus, it needed as much or more detail as the sand and surroundings. But luckily, it's actually incredibly simple to make. Essentially, take a flat plane and add a spatial material. From here, set the albedo to be a semi-believable transparent lake colour. Blue usually works. Then tweak the roughness until we have a nice amount of reflected light coming off the surface. Now, as there is no geometry on this flat plane, to add detail we can use a normal map. We set the texture of the normal map to be based on procedural noise, noise being an approximation of randomness in the form of a texture which Godot can produce with a click of a button. And already we have procedural and tweakable detail added to the water's surface lighting. Right now these ripples look way too big, so to fix that we can tweak the scale of the UV map, essentially stretching or compressing the texture being painted onto the plane to achieve our believable small surface waves. Then I'm back to tweaking the roughness in clear coat again until the light reflected pleases my eye, and to simulate how light bends in water we can enable the refraction setting. And already it's looking quite good to me, however as with all things in 3D, small amounts of polish go a long way. If you've seen my earlier videos, you'd know I always like to use ambient movement to add extra flavour to my scenes. To do this for the water, we first convert the spatial material into a shader material. This will maintain all the previously configured parameters, but importantly it allows us to modify the underlying shader code. To simulate the movement of small waves, all we need to do is modify the normal map's UV position every frame, effectively scrolling our noise texture across the plane's surface. I've talked about it before, but subtlety really is key when dealing with ambient movement. It does not take a lot to make the waves look unbelievable on such a small body of water, so it really needs to match the intensity and approximate direction of other things affected by wind, like the sand particles and surrounding plants. Another extra step, albeit a little more expensive, is to use a reflection probe to more accurately show the sky and surroundings in the water's surface. Just make sure the green box encompasses the water and enable box projection for this outdoor setting. Another issue that always stands out in 3D are hard edges. No matter how straight an edge or corner may seem in the real world, there are always imperfections and a degree of curvature or blending where two objects meet, so it's almost a sin how abruptly any 3D objects intersect one another, creating an entirely unnatural transition that our eyes automatically identify as looking out of place. The first trick I like to use is a subtle blending of textures or darkening of colours around such edges to try and make the transition less obvious. Here I'm just darkening the sand the closer it is to the water's edge, much the same way damp sand would occur in real life. The next often overlooked setting is proximity fade, that smooths the transition of where objects intersect. This can lead to objects disappearing when the camera is too close to them, but assuming the player isn't crawling anywhere, we can kind of get away with it for certain ground objects as a simple means to hide the otherwise harsh transition. The last and perhaps simplest solution I will show is to simply cover edges as best you can with other objects, as long as it works in the context of the scene. While I think this suits this concept, it definitely doesn't look like Arrakis anymore. So I return to the source material to get some inspiration for a new 3D monster. Once again both films had me covered, providing some great shots of the native 400 meter long sandworms. Perhaps a game where a player controls or rides a sandworm could be something I look at down the track, but I had enough for now to get started. Once in Blender, add a cylinder shape and press E to extrude and S to scale. Yeah, this isn't going to go into that. Just know that I did a bit of sculpting for each segment of the worm, then duplicated them out making sure to randomly rotate each bit. I created a convoluted mouth that would eventually not even be seen, pressed S to scale again, 
and created a simple bone rig that would surely not cause any issues when weight painting. No! God, please, oh no! God! No! The pain! No! Yep, once again I wasted a frankly depressing amount of time not figuring out how weight painting works, before finally deciding my sandworm didn't need teeth. With that problem out of the way, I thought it'd be smooth sailing from here to animate the worm along a curved path and... I think I have another lesson here, but it's not related to the sandworm. Being a solo game developer is hard, and 3D in particular is immensely time consuming. I work in Python for my day job, but ultimately everything you see on my channel is self-taught. From Blender 3D modelling, rigging, texturing, sculpting, and even reluctant weight painting, to then directing and composing everything in a game engine, where you have to consider lighting and colour profiles, sound design, the list is almost literally endless. It's incredibly easy to look at bad 3D work like this janky sandworm and immediately blame the tools, but ultimately it is not the game engine or blender that makes my work look like a game from 10 years ago, but rather it's my lack of resources and experience. From what I can tell, many of those using Godot are in the same boat, being solo developers and possibly without professional experience. But you don't have to look far to see that a lot of good looking indie titles are often led by ex AAA development teams that employ entirely custom approaches to solving their specific needs or creating bespoke mechanics, agnostic of their engine choice. So when I see people saying there's a lack of good looking indie Godot titles and therefore it's bad at 3D, well, show me the 30 man indie team of ex AAA developers using it to make such games. It's wholly unfair to pit the likes of me and other solo developers against the 35 person Hinterland studio who developed The Long Dark for example, and then say your work doesn't look as good as theirs so your game engine choice is bad. Believe me, me using Unity or Unreal will not make me a better artist, composer, director, storyteller, musician or developer. Now this seems to me a chicken and egg scenario, the big indie studios making great looking 3D games don't use Godot presumably as they don't feel it supports their preferred workflows that likely stem from their ex AAA experience. But in them not using Godot and providing feedback on what they need, such workflows will never be developed to support them. I don't know what the solution is beside the one that Godot devs are following, which is to continue improving and listening to the user base to create the best open source tool they can, and hopefully over time more and more game studios will try it, provide feedback, and allow it to grow to support them much in the same way Blender did. I hope none of what I've said has put you off game dev, the very challenge of having so much to learn is really why I love it, and relish the diverse skill sets it's pushed me to explore. Godot remains to me the most inclusive, open and fun way to get into it, the same way Python is to programming, and even after two-ish years, I feel I'm nowhere near the point where I can confidently point at the tool and say, this is what's holding me back. Anyway, I feel this has devolved into a ramble, so we'll leave it there for now. I have more ideas for interactive concepts and even some full blown games that I might finish one day, but for now we'll continue to just enjoy Blender and Godot to create and solve interesting problems, and really recommend it to anyone as a way to improve and express yourself, learn, play or even start your own career. Thanks for watching.